Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Arise with Sally Goodwin. It is a very dark, very cold day in Cape Town, South Africa. And um, it is also a public holiday <laughs> in South Africa. It is um, what our public holiday, what we call Youth Day, which is a commemoration of the youths that lost their lives um, fighting apartheid, uh, fighting against an unjust and unrighteous state of law in our country. And um, so today commemorates specifically something called Sharpville, which is when um, a whole lot of youths were protesting the unfair laws and regulations in our nation. And they um, were in a battle with police and many of them lost their lives. So it's a public holiday here in South Africa, very early in the morning, very cold, dark winter's morning. But it is good morning, Martha. Lovely to see you, my friend. But it is, yeah, it is a day when we remember, when we remember the lives that were lost in the fight against apartheid, um, against an unfair, unjust, unrighteous state. Good morning, Ethne. Lovely to see you, my friend. And it is so interesting how these things um, come to pass <laughs> because, and how God is just so intentional about things. So today is the 16th of June, 2022, and it is the 17th of Sivan, uh, 5782. Before I go any further, I wanted to read you. So remember, if you were watching, if you watched my live on Tuesday, Tuesday morning, I quoted a scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 20. And I read it from the Amplified Bible on Tuesday. But I wanted to read it to you just again um, from the scriptures. And so the scriptures is a translation as close as possible to the original um, Hebrew or the original Greek, it's when a whole lot of different people in a whole lot of different nations of the world all got together and um, set out to translate the Bible from the original, as close to the original Hebrew and as close to the original Greek as they could possibly get, and then to translate it into English. And in this in this translation, the scriptures, they use the Jewish names for God and Jesus, etc., etc., uh, but sometimes the difference in the translation is just so, when you read this translation, it just, there's just something that comes across differently from other translations. So this is 2 Corinthians um, chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, the same verse that I read, same verses that I read on, on Tuesday. And it says, And all matters are from Elohim, who has restored us to favor with himself, through Yeshua Messiah, and has given us the service of restoration to favor. That is, that Elohim was in Messiah, restoring the world to favor unto himself, not reckoning their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of restoration to favor. Therefore, we are envoys on behalf of Messiah, as though Elohim were pleading through us, we beg, on behalf of Messiah, be restored to favor with Elohim. And I just thought that that, you know, because what I was, what I was getting across on Tuesday was this whole thing about restoration, reconciliation, and you know, that we are restored and thus, you know, our connection is restored and there is a restoration to favor. And then we get to be ministers of reconciliation and restoration. And I then I read it in the, the scriptures and I just thought that the way they translated it was so 
exactly what I was trying to say on Tuesday. So I wanted to read that to you today. Uh, so yes, so today is also the 17th of Sivan, as I said just now. And the 17th of Sivan is the day when the Ark, Noah's Ark, came to rest on the summit of Mount Ararat. So, it, you know, we all know the story of Noah, but it had rained for 40 days and 40 nights. And then obviously, even after the rain stopped and the earth was completely flooded, it was several months before the waters had subsided enough for the ark to actually come to rest on anywhere. And then it was another several months from then onwards where before the waters had subsided enough for the dove to bring back an olive leaf um, for Noah and his family to know that it was safe to exit the ark. So, but that happened um, centuries ago in, on today, today's date, um, the ark actually came to rest on Mount Ararat. And it was obviously a symbol for Noah that, you know, the time in the ark was coming to an end. It, it, he still had to wait several months before he actually could exit the ark with his family and all the animals. But the, the, he could see that it was coming to an end, you know? Um, and so on Tuesday, I was talking about all of this restoration and, and this restoration to favor and restoration of connection and all of that. And I wanted to share with you, because I said that I would um, on Tuesday, I wanted to share with you another encounter I had with the Lord. So, I just want you to imagine for a moment Noah coming to rest, you know, Noah and the ark with his family and the ark comes to rest on the top, the summit of Mount Ararat. But if he'd looked out of the windows of the ark, he, would, he couldn't see the land that the ark was resting on. So it was just the ark was resting on the summit of Mount Ararat, but all around him, he would only have been able to see water. He would only have been able to see, you know, he wouldn't have been able to see anything else because nothing, everything else was submerged under the water. And it was only as the water subsided and as when the dove came back with the olive leaf that he would have been able to actually open the, the doors of the ark and step out onto the ground and see the earth revealed the way God had intended for her to be revealed. And so I'm asking you to imagine that because I want that to just be a precursor to what I'm going to speak about now. So the, the encounter I had with the Lord, and this was a few weeks ago, uh, yeah, probably three or four weeks ago, I had this encounter with the Lord and I saw this picture of a puzzle. So there was this picture of a puzzle in front of me and initially, I could only see the top half of the puzzle. And the top half of the puzzle um, was blue skies. Um, it, you, it was a picture of blue skies. And, um, and I could see almost the tops of a, good morning, Jen. Lovely to see you, my friend. <laughs> I actually was not expecting anyone to be on live this morning because of the, of the fact that it's a public holiday in South Africa. I was expecting most people to be sleeping late. I know my friend Jen has a, a little baby boy, not so much of a baby anymore, I suppose, but still he probably wakes up early. But, uh, but I, I wasn't expecting anyone to be on. I was fully expecting it just to be me preaching to the camera this morning. So I'm very grateful for all of you who have joined me this morning. Anyway, so I had this encounter with the Lord, and in this encounter, I saw this puzzle. It was this puzzle, and you know when you've made the puzzle all up, so it's every, all the pieces are together, and then you get the full picture. And the full picture, I couldn't see the full picture of this puzzle. It was like when I first, when I first was looking at it, I could only see the top section of the puzzle, but I could see um, like blue skies and what looked like... Um, you know, it looked, it, the picture looked like it was going to be beautiful. It was blue skies and like you could see light and I could just see that once the picture came off, once I could see the rest of the puzzle piece, the puzzle, rest of the whole puzzle, it was going to be this beautiful picture. But as I kind of 
almost sort of zoomed out and the whole of the puzzle came into my view so I could now see, I should be able to see the whole of the picture. There was almost like another picture like stuck on top of it. So it was like stuck over the original picture. So you could see the top section of the original picture, which was like, you know, these blue skies and it looked really, really looked like it was going to be a really beautiful picture. But then there was almost this other picture that had been sort of stuck over it, like a big sticker, stuck over it. And it was almost covering it. And it was very, it was a dark picture. I couldn't see actually anything specific in this picture. I could just see a lot of black and sort of a very dark red kind of mixed together in this picture. Um, it looked almost like really kind of evil looking flowers or something in this picture, but it was, it, was not, it was not a pretty picture. It was not a pleasant picture at all. And this picture that was like superimposed on top of the original picture of the puzzle was, was like obscuring the whole picture. And, and it almost looked, as I watched it, it almost looked as if the picture was growing. So the, the ugly picture was almost like spreading over and superimposing itself on top of this beautiful puzzle that had been put together. And so I've been sitting with the Lord about this and kind of really just asking him what what is it that he was trying to say with this whole thing and um, he actually he gave me this verse from Psalm 119 verse 18 which says open my eyes that I might see wonders from your teaching and and I kind of thought okay you know, I want my eyes to be open so that I can fully understand what is actually going on with this thing that I'm seeing. But eventually, and so this is all along the same lines as the restoration, you know, um, as, you know, connection restored, restoration to favor that I was talking about. And I realized after uh, the second encounter with the Lord, I realized that they were both connected and that he was trying to show me something. So the first picture was almost like a precursor to the second one that I shared with you yesterday. But what he said to me, or some of what he said to me was this. So look at ourselves as individuals, okay? Often for ourselves as individuals, as we go through our lives, it feels like we put puzzle pieces together. You know, we kind of... Um, we have our original puzzle piece, you know, the sort of beginning of our life, and then pieces are added from our childhood, and, and pieces are, then we, we get married, and pieces are added from there, and, you know, and it gradually it sort of makes up this picture, or this this picture of what our, um, our life looks like, and we don't have the we don't have the, the privilege of having a box <laughs> picture to follow. You know, often when you make a puzzle, you know, you're looking at the picture on the box to fit the pieces in all the right place. And we don't have the privilege of that really. But we're building this beautiful picture. And because we know that God, before he even formed us in our mother's wombs, um, God, God knew us and he knew. So God knew what our, what our completed puzzle and that picture was supposed to look like. And so he has, you know, already um, put that completed puzzle with its beautiful picture on the inside of us. But then the enemy comes along and the enemy tries to superimpose his picture of what your life should look like on top of that original beautiful picture. So if he can't remove pieces of the puzzle, you know, often that's what he'll do is he'll just remove pieces of the puzzle and, and leave us feeling like we are incomplete, like we don't have all of our puzzle pieces in place. We feel like we, we, we spend our lives kind of searching and trying to find that one puzzle piece that completes our picture. And often that one puzzle piece is Jesus. For, for those of us who, you know, before we were believers or before we got saved or, you know, before we walked with the Lord fully, that puzzle piece that was missing was Jesus. 
And once we put that puzzle piece back in, we complete the picture. But the picture still isn't the original picture that God designed. The picture is, is, is being superimposed over it by the plans of the enemy. So how does he do that? Trauma in our lives, things in our childhood that we had no control over, um, choices that we've made, decisions that we've made, all of those things that happen in our lives that, that make, give the enemy the ability to be able to superimpose his picture of what something should look like over God's original design. And as I just processed that, like, and so the whole connection restored or restoration is God is wanting to restore to you your, the original puzzle, the original puzzle picture that he, that he spoke out over your life before you were even formed in your mother's womb. He wants to remove all the, the bits and pieces, the, 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 the stickers that the enemy has tried to superimpose over that picture of your life to make it look the way he wants it to look. So remember, the enemy, he cannot create. You know, God is the creator. God creates everything. But what the enemy does is he counterfeits. So that would be exactly him. He would come and he would counterfeit. So he puts sticks another picture on top of God's original design. And then, he's, and then he convinces us that that is actually the picture. So when we look at the story of our life, when we look at the puzzle that makes up our life, the puzzle is complete because we have Jesus. But the picture is not the picture that God originally spoke out over us. It is, it's, it might, we might have all the pieces in place and none of the pieces are missing, but we still aren't seeing that beautiful picture that God originally spoke over us. And he, and so because the enemy has superimposed these things um, over, over it. And so, I mean, we know as believers that we, we do everything that we can to restore that picture without even necessarily being aware of what we're doing. You know, but we, we all know that we've had trauma from our childhoods. We've had things that have happened to us. We've had dis choices and decisions that were bad ones that we made, you know. We've all done that. We all know that sort of thing. And we, then we walk a road of healing. You know, we go for deliverance. We go for inner healing. We go for sozo. You know, we go for all of those things to restore that picture so that we we can get healed and we can see that picture, that original design that God actually spoke out over us, restored to the way God sees it, unencumbered by the stickers and the, the, you know, the things that the enemy has tried to superimpose on that. And I think that that is actually, that that is actually something that we do through our whole life. You know, we, and the enemy tries to creep on, you know, and superimpose a, another picture on this puzzle piece of our life. And then we deal with that. And then he tries to, and we deal with that. But, but that, but once we have the, once we have seen the whole picture, the way God actually intended for it to be, we have that whole picture within our minds. And we know that that is what, you know, we, that is what actually is our life. That's what our life story looks like. That is what God sees. And that is what we aspire to, to be a part of and to walk in. And so it becomes more difficult for the enemy to superimpose his counterfeit picture over that because, of, because we have seen the picture and we know what it is supposed to look like. But I want to just take that a step further and look at that, look at that vision in terms of our nation, in terms of nations around the world, you know, God has a destiny that he has spoken over Africa. God has a destiny that he has spoken over South Africa. And he, there was an original puzzle with an original picture that was beautiful and amazing and incredible. But the enemy has come along and in some instances with some nations, with some regions, with some, with some communities, he has so he has done such a good job of covering the puzzle with his counterfeit picture that we only see that picture we only see that picture
They are people groups and nations and communities and places where if we think of those people groups or we think of that nation or we think of that place, we only see the counterfeit image of what the enemy has put over that. We don't see God's original picture. We've forgotten that there even was an original picture. And we tend to pray from or warfare from a place where the counterfeit picture that the enemy wants us to see is actually in our minds. And in order to, the God, is, God is shifting and changing things continually. We are in the season where God is just, he's just accelerating things. He's shifting things. He's changing things. He's moving things around. He's, it's almost as though for the last couple of years, I felt as, almost as though he's setting the stage. You know, it's like he's setting the stage for the final act. You know, he's positioning um, people and, and thing, pe people and ministries and all of that, you know, for, for the final act. He's, he's, he's doing all of this. And please understand me here. I'm not saying that the final act, you know, is just around the corner. I'm not, I'm just, you know, God does things over years and we think, how did it take so long? But time is nothing to the Lord. So, but it feels to me like that's what he's doing. You know, he's just, he's ramping things up on the earth. He's accelerating things on the earth. He's moving and moving and moving on the earth. And, and so prayer, the way we pray and the way we warfare in the spirit is changing. It's shifting and changing. Things are happening whereas years ago, we would have, you know, been sort of on our knees, interceding, pushing in, pushing in, pushing in. And when we warfare, it was like, you know, are we warfaring correctly? And we warred and we warred and we warred. And nothing that, there's nothing wrong with any of that. But it's almost as if the Lord has accelerated things and shifted things to this point where it's no longer such a, it's no longer this, this, you know, months and years on our knees interceding for something. Now, again, it's not that there's anything wrong with that. And in fact, there are probably still things that we will be on our knees interceding for, for months and years into the next generation. So I'm not, understand something, I'm not saying that that is no longer, I'm saying that in certain spaces, God has shifted and changed and kind of amped up the way things work and things, there are some instances where things happen faster they just, so let me give you an example. And I might have shared this already, so forgive me if I have. Sometimes in between preaching and live CBN and speaking at different events, I forget where I've shared what. But I was invited to speak at a crusade in Kailitsha um, a couple of weeks ago. And in the morning of the crusade, I woke up and I felt... I, I felt ill. I wasn't feeling very well. And I, I, there was a whole team ministering at this crusade. So I sort of thought to myself, you know, um, they won't miss me if I'm not there. You know, they've got all of these other incredibly anointed people who are going to be there. So they won't miss me if I'm not there. So I messaged uh, my, my friend who was running the crusade and I said to her, listen, I'm not feeling very well. And she knows all of my health struggles. And um, so I said, I might not make today. And then and then I was chatting with another um, beautiful friend of mine, and she said to me, Sally, I feel as though um, you really need to go. Like, I feel as though evil is actually trying to keep you from, from going there. So I said to her, okay, you know what? So I messaged this friend of mine who was running the crusade, and I said to her, listen, I'm going to come. I'm going to be late uh, because I just need to... I, you know, took some medication and kind of tried to make myself feel a bit better. But I said, I'm going to come. And, um, and I, so I did, I got, I got there, but um, they were still worshiping when I got there. So it wasn't, nobody had missed me or anything. But my husband and I literally, we pulled our car in, we got out of the car, we walked around and they were worshiping outside. So we walked around and I walked onto the ground where they were worshiping and I sort of stood back for a little bit and my husband went ahead and he was greeting people and all of that kind of thing. But I stood back a little bit because I just like to um, get a feel for what's happening in the spirit around me. And as I stood there, I just, I literally had just had my feet on the ground where this crusade was taking place. And as I stood there in the spirit, I just saw principalities falling. 
just principalities. And this is in, in the middle of Kailicha. And I just saw, I saw um, spirits, principalities of racism falling, principalities of poverty falling. I just saw principalities falling. And then in the spirit, I saw the stronghold. Um, one of the strongholds over that region, I saw it started to rock like this on its so it was starting to shake, it was starting to shake, it was starting to shake. And as I stood there and I watched all of this happen in the spirit, God said to me, you can go now. <laughs> and I said to him, what? And he said, you've done what you came here to do. All I needed you to do was step fully into your authority, into your identity. I needed you to step fully into the authority that I've given you, into who you are in me, and put your feet on the ground. All you needed to do was put your feet on the ground. And just you being there and, and walking in that authority, the calling that's on my life, because I have a, a calling as a prophet to speak um, words over regions, over uh, cities and towns and regions that the word of the Lord and what I've realized is that what I get to speak over these places is God's original picture for them. God's original picture for them. And it was just the most incredible experience and so humbling, just so humbling how how God can move like that, how he can use us, each one of us he can literally, if we are just obedient to just step into that space that he has asked us to step into, he will move in his power and his glory and do things. And sometimes we don't even have to say a word. Now, granted, I've been going into Kailicha on a Saturday morning, you know, over the last sort of year and a half. And so, and I've, I teach at a Bible school there. So I have, there, there is a um, an authority that I carry because I have been in the area and I've been bringing what God has wanted me to bring into the area. So there is that, but but it was just the most, and it was like he said to me, you can go now. If literally, if you're not feeling well, you can go now. And I just, and I said to him, no, I think everyone here will think that's a bit weird. If I say, okay, I'm done, <laughs> you know, and I haven't said a word or anything. So I stayed right until, I stayed right until the end. But you know what the amazing thing was? It was, this crusade was um, sort of done in obedience by an amazing friend of mine. And, um, and the, the, on the day, it was like the sound guy was delayed. I woke up ill. The sound guy was delayed by like two hours. So we had no sound for the first like two hours. We had one beautiful guy just playing a guitar and worshiping, but with no mic, no nothing. And yet, and yet the presence of God fell. It was mind blowing. The presence of God just descended on that place and he just it was just like his glory and his fire and his power and it just came and it just it was so tangible it was so tangible you could almost taste it it was so tangible and eventually right at the end uh, my friend said to me you know I want you to give a word and I said to you know I don't actually have to speak to me, everything God wanted to happen has happened. It, it, it was just the, be, it's just the beginning of something that God is doing in that space. And Kailicha, it's just the beginning. And I said to you, you know, I, just, I don't actually have to speak. I don't have to speak at all because I can see that God has done what he came here to do. And she said to me, no, Sally, as a prophet, you need to speak a word <laughs> over these people and over this place. And I said to her, okay, um, but I prophesy regularly over Kailicha from the Bible school, you know, and so so I, I really kind of was standing there thinking, okay, and then I obviously I had that word that I've released previously over Africa, and so there was a little bit of that, but but that word actually came forth at Bible school in Kailicha, that, that word that I've spoken and released over Africa, that it, it burst forth in that Bible school in Kailicha, so they've heard that. Anyway, but as I stood there, it was like God said to me, so the name Kailicha means a new home. A new home. Isn't it beautiful? Hey? And, um, and God said to me, Kailicha is my new home where I will do my new thing. And you know that in that moment, and this was after he, I'd had the encounter with him about the puzzle. In that moment, 
I saw Kailicha the way God originally intended her to look like. I saw the puzzle all put together, the puzzle that is Kailicha all put together with the picture that God originally intended over. I saw the picture of Kailicha with all of those the, 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 the pictures that the enemy was trying to superimpose on top of Kailicha, I saw the actual picture of Kailicha. And do you know, do you know that we have authority over that which we love? We can pray for, for people, for nations, for leaders, for all that kind of thing. We can pray for them. And I'm not saying that our prayers, you know, that says the prayers, the Bible says the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. I'm not saying that our prayers don't get anywhere. But I'm saying that when you love something, when you love something, when you love your nation, you pray from a different space. When you love your community, when you love your, your region or your city, you pray from a different space. That love for that place gives you an authority. It gives you an authority to step in. And I can honestly say, I love Kailicha. I love the people there. They are the most amazing, incredible people. They are hungry for the Lord. They want to see God move. They, they, they give their last, their last of whatever they have to follow God. And I realized that for some of us, when we are praying for something, even for our own nation, let's look at South Africa for, for you know, as an example, when we are praying, even for our own nation, we are not always praying from a place of love. And we don't pray from a place of love because we are look, seeing the picture that the enemy has superimposed over our nation. We are seeing the picture that the enemy is superimposed over our nation. We are not seeing God's picture of South Africa. Now, that doesn't mean that we live in denial. It doesn't mean that we live in denial for the things that are wrong within our nation, for the things that need addressing. We don't live in denial, you know, of corruption and poverty and all of that kind of thing. We don't pretend that those things aren't here. You know, that's not, we don't look at the pretty picture and just pretend that the enemy isn't trying to superimpose his own picture over that. We, we look at those things, but we see beyond them to what God actually originally intended. So like when Noah, when, when the ark finally landed on the summit of Mount Ararat, Noah, he'd already been in there for how long with his family and the animals. All he could see around him was water, but he had to stand in faith that after a few months only, that water would subside enough for him to see the beauty of the earth revealed. God's, the way God originally intended the earth to be revealed because he'd now destroyed all the, you know, the evil and the unrighteous. So he saw the beauty. He had to stand in faith for a picture that he couldn't actually see yet. And sometimes, even for us as individuals, sometimes it's not always the enemy. Sometimes God obscures the picture for us. Sometimes he says, remember when I first saw that picture, when I first was looking into that vision, I only saw the top section of the beautiful picture that was God's. And then I saw the pieces the enemy had superimposed over it. So I've never seen actually that full beautiful picture. Even though I'm praying that the enemies, the stuff the enemy is superimposed will come, you know, will come away from it. Um, I'm still not seeing the full beautiful picture. And sometimes God does that. Sometimes God shows us just a bit of the picture so that because then we have to stand in faith. We have to stand in faith and trust him that th that, that is going to be fulfilled. And so, but, but sometimes we, we look at a situation, we look at a person, we look at a nation, we look at a people group, we look at a culture, and we only see the enemy's picture. And we don't bother to scrape back, you know, and, and, and peel it off and, and say, wow, look at this, you know, look at this. Do you know in, in, the, in the wars, in the various wars that have happened on our planet, um, art forgery, you know, when art is, is smuggled from one country to another country, often they get another painter, an artist, to paint, um, a, a, 
to paint a picture on top of the original expensive art piece. He, this, this artist or forger paints another picture on top of it and so that the art piece gets sold and there's no knowledge that it's actually this original expensive piece of art. And then when it gets to its final destination, they have someone who, who gently and painstakingly restores, removes the, 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 the paint, the forgery, the, the forged painting from that picture and gently and painstakingly and patiently restores the original artwork to its original glory. And that is exactly what God calls us to do. When he calls us to be ministers of restoration, he calls us to see his picture for a nation, for a people group, for a culture, and for us to be the ones who then gently, painstakingly, and patiently restore that picture to its original glory. It's, it's, I want to just quickly, I've just remembered this verse in Proverbs. I just need to find it. Um, to find it quickly, or oh, of course I didn't, it wasn't one of the verses I was originally going to read from, so I'm just having to search through my Bible to actually find the, where's Proverbs? Uh, Proverbs, here we go. Um, Proverbs, in Proverbs 31, uh, where is it now? Sorry, just be patient with me while I just find the... Where is it? It says something about she takes a nation. She holds the land or something. Okay, I can't find it now. Um, yeah, I can't. I can't find it. <laughs> but it says, but somewhere in Proverbs chapter 31, when they're speaking about this, this Proverbs woman, you know, um, who, who is, a, who's also representative, it's not just a, you know, something that women have to follow and try and live up to. It is representative actually of, um, of a woman who uh, is representative of the bride, you know, of the bride of Christ, that this is what the bride of Christ, you know, aspires to be as well. And, um, and somewhere in here, and I can't find it now, but I'll find it and I'll, and I'll post it um, on, this, on this video when I'm done. Somewhere in there, it says something about um, her carrying her land or carrying her nation or something like that in her heart. And that is what God has called us to do. He has called us to, to ask him to reveal to us the, the, the original piece, the original puzzle piece, the original painting, the original picture that he has ordained for our lives, for the lives of our families, for the lives of our communities, our nation, our cities, etc., etc. And then to be ministers of restoration. Exactly as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 to 20, to bring, to be ministers of, of restoration and restore that picture to pray from a place of seeing the original destiny that God had ordained for something rather than the picture that the enemy has superimposed over it. And things will happen in our lives, you know, things happen and, and those things happen and they make us want to believe in that picture that the enemy has superimposed, you know, because we want to believe that because we see the terrible things that are going on and we think, okay, like this is it, this, this, this nation is lost, the enemy has, but it's not lost as long as they are Christians, as long as they are believers in Jesus, as long as they are laid down lovers of Jesus, prepared to be ministers of reconciliation, prepared to be a people who will see the picture that God originally ordained and decree and declare that picture and pray that picture out over their nation that not, all is not lost. All is not lost. And so I just decree and declare over each and every one of you an anointing to be a minister of reconciliation.
an anointing to see the original picture that God ordained right in the beginning. That firstly, that you will see the whole picture, that you will see all the puzzle pieces joined together and that that will be the whole picture and that you will see the original picture, God's original design before the enemy started superimposing his counterfeit design on top of it. I, th I think that that encounter with the Lord there's still more that he's going to reveal to me. I don't, I feel as though I haven't um, all the revelation yet, but, but I know that it is part of this, part of this, this thing about being ministers of reconciliation and restoration, that that is something that God is calling the church to and calling each of us as individuals to. So I just bless you with that today. And I bless you with a, with a beautiful, wonderful um, Youth Day. And I, I, take, I trust that we will all remember what Youth Day actually commemorates and that we will take some time to pray into our nation that lives will not have lost, been lost in vain, that Mama Africa will not have sacrificed her children in vain, that South Africa and Africa will step into their destinies exactly the way God had ordained it from the beginning of time. And I just leave that with you and I ask that you stand with me in that prayer. And if this word resonated with you, please like and share. <laughs> and I will see you next Tuesday at 7 a.m. Thank you so much to all of you who joined me on this public holiday. <laughs> I really appreciate all of you. And um, yeah, I'll see you next week. Lots of love.